Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Miner. I'm a professional technician, technologist. Uh, I belong to IPET, uh, SAT, and then SIC. And I'm also an ex assessor, moderator, and reviewer. A lot of you have come. Go, good to be known that you come and uh, attend this. Welcome to all those and all the new people there. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the code of conduct for registered persons at the Engineering Council of South Africa, which will be referred to as EXA under the following headings. Where the code of conduct, when, the, when was the code of conduct promulgated, the need of the code of conduct, the definitions and the rules and, of ethics and administrative matters. Okay, the registration, uh, the uh, promulgation of the code of conduct for registered persons. Okay, that uh, the Engineering Council of South Africa XA, has, man has the mandate to, under section 36 of the Engineering Professional Act, Act number 46 of 2000, to draw up the code of conduct under section 27 of the mentioned act. There was a board notice that was published in the Government Gazette on the 17th of March 2017 under the heading Code of Conduct for Registered Persons under the Engineering Professional Act 2000, Act number 46 of 2000. We need to, why do we need the Code of Conduct? We need to ensure a registered person can do their work in the field of expertise with integrity and according to accepted norms of professional conduct. Ensure that the public interests are respected. Ensure that registered persons honor the profession. Ensure that the public health and safety is adhered to. Okay. And ensure that you improve your skills on a continuous basis. Ensure that the skills of your subordinates are improved on a continuous basis. Encourage excellence in the engineering profession. Ensure that you apply your knowledge and skills in the interest of the general public and the environment in your field of expertise. Okay, we're going to go and talk just a little bit under definitions. Definitions used in this presentation are as per the code of conduct listed below. Act, we will be referring to the Engineering Professional Act 2000, Act 46 of 2000. Council. Now that is the Engineering Council of South Africa established by section two of the act. Engineering work, the process of applying engineering and scientific principles, concepts, contextual and engineering knowledge of research, planning, implementation and management of the work in both the natural and built environments. Okay, information. Engineering documents and data produced or relied upon by the registered person in the performance of the work that form part material part of the project records, including competent person or similar appointments, design, calculation drawings, and inspection certificates, whether in electronic format or otherwise. Registered person is a, regi a person registered in, the ter in terms of the act work any engineering work normally carried out by a registered person in the practice of their profession okay the rules of conduct we're going to discuss the ethics a registered person must comply with the rules of ethic conduct as stated in the following headings competency integrity public interest environment dignity of the profession So what the first one we're going to talk about under uh, ethics is a competency. A registered person must at all times adhere to the following. Do his or her work with due care, skill, and with diligence towards the employer, clients, associates, and the public. Must only take on work they have the education, training, and experience of competency within the category of their competency carry out their work within the norms of the profession. A registered, now we go to talk about integrity. A registered person must adhere to the following under the heading integrity. Must discharge his or her duties with integrity, fidelity, and honesty towards the employer, 
clients, associates, and the public must not do work that could compromise their ability to carry out work in accordance to the norms of the profession, must not engage in act of dishonesty, corruption, or bribery, must at all times avoid conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest. You may not knowingly permit misrepresentation of your of your own or another person's academic or professional qualifications. You must always give engineering decisions, recommendations, or opinions that are honest, objective, and based on facts. You must not improperly seek to obtain work through commission or payment to obtain work. You must ensure all work has been reviewed or inspected before certifying as correct. You may not divulge any information of a confidential nature which you obtained in the exercise of your duties. You must notify the council on becoming insolvent where such insolvency is caused by your negligence or incompetence in performing engineering work. Notify the council if you have been removed from an office of trust due to improper conduct. Notify the council if you have been convicted of an offence and imprisoned without an option of a fine. Notify the council if you are convicted in the case of fraud to a fine or imprisonment or both. Okay, now we're going to talk about public interest. A registered person must adhere to the following under the heading public interest must at all times give priority to the health, safety, and interest of the public. When providing professional advice to a client or employer and the professional advice is not accepted, the client or employer must be notified to the consequences that may be detrimental to the health, safety, and interests to the public. The council must also be informed of the client's or the employer's action immediately of the above. I registered now, we're going to the dignity of the profession. Now, this is where you are actually the brand name for EXA. A registered person must adhere to the following under the heading dignity of the profession. Your conduct must be so that it upholds the dignity, standing, and the reputation of the profession. You must not be mis. mis uh, uh, I've got a problem with that word, or falsely knowingly injure the professional reputation or business of any other registered person or reputation of the council. You may not improperly supplant or attempt to supplant a registered person in a particular engagement of the registered person has been employed. You may not ad advertise your professional services in a misleading or exaggerated, exaggerated manner or in a manner that is harmful to the dignity of the profession. You may not review work carried out by another registered person for a particular client. Here are the conditions that you may do that. You can review work for, of another registered person under these circumstances. Reviews carried out for a different client, prior knowledge from the other registered person, receipt <coughs> of the notification in writing from the client and the services of the registered person has been terminated. Review for purposes of dispute resolution or legal proceedings, inclusive proceedings arising from these rules and then a routine or statutory checks. Okay, administrative, rules of conduct under administrative, administrative responsibility of a registered person. You may not destroy or dispose of any information within the 10 year period of completion of the work. May not place contracts or orders on their, cl their clients or employers behalf without written authority. You may not issue any information prepared or by any other person under their direction or control unless this of information has the following. 
name of organization, date of preparation, name of registered person or another appropriately qualified and authorized person. Where your signature is required as a registered person, you may use electronic signature as defined as in the Electronic Communications Transactional Act 2002, Act number 25 of 2002. When working outside the Republic of South Africa, the laws of that country apply. A registered person must supervise and take responsibility for work done by their subordinates, inclusive of persons registered as candidates. When the council requests information, this information must be supplied to the council in the writing. You must notify the council of change of your physical address. You must correspond to correspondence received from clients, colleagues, the council within 30 days as far as it relates to work or proceedings in the terms of these rules. Okay. Okay, now in conclusion with acknowledgement, today we discuss the following. The board notice 41 of 2007 Code of Conduct for Registered Person Engineering Act 2002, Act number 46 of 2002. The presentation is also based on the above what I just uh, stated now. And that is basically everything. And thank you for attending and any questions further. Chris, was these the rules changed in the uh, last couple of years? Beg your pardon? Were these rules changed in the last couple of years? Yeah, this is the latest one, 2017. The previous one they changed up, and the latest one is uh, March 2017, which has been issued. Do you, have a, copy? One that, Do you have a copy uh, of those uh, rules? Uh, you get it off their website under documents from uh, EXA. It's on their website under the heading documents, and then you'll get it there. Oh, well, I'm asking you. You also get it on their website. That's where I've got it. Uh, if, if you already downloaded it, you can just forward it to me. <laughs> yes, I will do that. I Thanks. will send it to you on. It's no problem. Thanks. Now, you get it off their website. They've got it on site there. They've brought out another uh, one is there uh, with the, the principles and the con of conduct and that, what they've done there, you know, the practice. It's based on this. So it's very much the same. You know, the practice of a, uh, to practice as a professional there. Yeah. I see we, how many people have we got here now? Um, I've got 16. Yeah, we're we 16 on. Uh, we... Okay. Anybody got questions at the moment? Not necessarily just on this. I can ask anything about the registration too. If you have Hi, sir. Please carry on. Yes, it's Kobo here. I just want to yes. ask a question uh, that is out of the code of conduct presentation. I just want to ask, um, I'm aware that there's a discount you get if you register uh, under EXA and you belong to a certain, I don't know if you, they call you club or volunteers or whatever. I just want to hear more details concerning that. What discount do I get maybe if I belong under, it's iPads, I believe you're, Okay. Yes. Yeah. yes, no, it is a voluntary organization that is recognized by EXA as a voluntary organization. Uh, Johan can discuss that quickly. Uh, if, you, if you belong to, if you are a registered person and you belong to any of the voluntary associations <clears throat> recognized by EXA, you get a, a discount 
on your extra fees annually. Now the discount on the extra fees is around um, 280 rand or something like that. I'm not sure of the exact fee. <coughs> But what I can tell you is that it's more as your, no, sorry, at 680 rand. Yeah. It's, um, it, and it's more than your IPET annual fees. So in other words, if you belong to EXA and uh, uh, if you're registered with EXA and, you, and, you, and you're an IPET member, your uh, discount actually pays for your, for your IPET membership. Uh, if you're a member of more than one organization, say for instance, you're also a member of the uh, institution, Institute of Electrical Engineers or the Institution of Civil Engineering or one of those, you only get once uh, a discount. But uh, the point is that um, uh, you do get a discount and it's a, it's a matter that we'll be taking up with EXA because uh, their fees have gone up through the years, but the last couple of years, the discount hasn't come, they were gone up. So that is not really uh, playing the ball, playing the game according to, to, to uh, ethical standards. <laughs> so, does that answer your question, uh, Kobo? Yes, yes sir. Uh, so for iPad, how much do you pay to be a part of the member? And does it, is it the same to all the vol voluntarily organization? the amount you pay or it's just different it differs in each organization it's different with each organization for ipet it's 525 rand a year if you're a registered professional if you're a, a graduate uh, your first year is free and then you pay uh, also the same and uh, obviously as a student it's free but uh, <clears throat> if you are a member of more than one uh the 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 each organization sets its own membership fees. And I must say that IPET is one of the, of the most affordable, most economic um, institutions to, uh, to belong to. Johan, I see you have got a hand up there. Um, hi, yes. Um, Johan, um, actually a question for Chris and you. Um, on behalf of the candidates, one of the big issues that I find with um, the candidates, as they say to me, on what kind of questions does the reviewers ask to establish my ethical behavior and how do they prove that? And um, how do they demonstrate in their TRs and in their application um, the ethical behavior? It's one of the outcomes. Chris, I'm okay. leaving that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you go to 8.1. The first thing that we ask there is, uh, do you, uh, what, uh, do you uh, what basically is you have to confirm in 8.1 that you do practice as, you know, your ethic is there. And it's usually a short answer. It's a yes or no. It's not a 10 page document. You just say, yes, I confirm I am under that. Then 8.2 is your ethics. Now, you can go through your um, code of conduct, which we discussed today. That will give you the guideline to say what is the ethics there. What we also ask is, we might ask a, a different question. It's not the same as no standard question at all. Of what do you understand under the code of conduct? Then the person can tell you about the ethics and, they, and then you might ask them about documents how long they must store it and what they can do or you give them an example to say you know you go and you got an example is like this you've got a few people working for you and you yourself is not registered in structures but you electrical and you go and do a high-rise building and you ask your friends but you're not registered so you tell them, I'll give you some money. That's what we ask there sometimes. And we, there's no standard question. It depends there. So what it writes there in his document is the standards. And they we were looking for a situation where they, in 8.2, is where they actually had an ethical problem. How did they solve it? And what did, you know, bribery and corruption is one of the easiest ones. But sometimes you ask them to do, explain something else how did they go about over designing getting the money for stuff that they did 
what they shouldn't be doing. How did they solve it? Over pricing, over uh, compensating for work that was not done. These are the ethical things that we find, and they must discuss that, you on. Right, no, great, thank you. That sort of answers my question. Chris, okay. if, 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 uh, um, <clears throat> if you're a contractor and uh, the client comes to you, uh, well, it, it, or, yeah, the client comes to you and says, yeah, he says to you, yes, but there's, there's a small problem with, with transport on the site. Uh, what, uh, what do you do? A small problem on transport on site. You, you know what the question means. Yeah, but you say go back to the contract document and see what is there. Otherwise, if it's not going to be there and you want something done that is not supposed to be done there, bribery or anything like that, I do get it. We do get it quite regularly. The clients come to us. I work in consultants that come to us. Or well, the contractor says, listen, yeah, man, we put in a bit extra and we can go hunting. And I say, no, sorry, you know, it doesn't work that way. And you can report them. Straight, if they belong to the contractors association, you report them for unethical. And even the, uh, if the person is registered by EXO, you report them. So you don't take bribery or corruption or anything like that. Because the trouble is you might get away with it now, but in five, ten years later, it actually comes back and hits you. We've got a good examples in our government what is happening now at the moment there. <clears throat> so we just be very careful. Chris, I have a small question. Yeah, happy with that, you are. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So I am asking. Yes. In the department, water affairs where I work, at the end of December, the used consultant used to come and distribute Christmas gift, not to engineers up to director general. So what is yeah. your opinion? We should accept or reject, or we should hand over to the department that this is a Christmas gift, is a government property, or what? No, basically what I do there is I say thank you very much, and I let everybody know in the office. I also get it from consult. I mean, other contractors and other consultants, they give you a small gift and clients and they say, and I say to everybody, this is a gift I received from them. And I open it up in front of everybody. But if it's money, I'm not interested at all. But you know, it's like they give you sometimes a teaspoon or they give you a special mug or sometimes they give you something that where it was banned for a while, you know, <laughs> you know, a bottle of whiskey or brandy or some wine. You open it up and you tell that is it. I've received this from the contractor and I just want to let you know. And you be open. But if it's money, you don't accept at all. I even had contractors giving me money. I send it back. And if he refuses and I call all his laborers together and tell him his boss has given me, give him extra bonuses because I did very good work. I'm not happy with that, but that solves the problem. I see Zolani has a question. Zolani, unmute yourself, please. Okay. okay, Johan, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. So I, I have a question. Yes, I would like to know if someone is not obeying to a standard, and then is it that a mistake or is it a, 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 a unethical behavior? For instance, I'm working in a laboratory, and then in a laboratory we have a competency standard which, which states that for every test that we do, we need to use the latest, the latest standard. And then you find that we are not using the latest standard. So I like to know, is that a unethical behavior or is it a mistake? Okay. okay. All right. I'll come in there. Okay. Your standards that you're using, what does your contract document say? Which standards are no. you using? No, no. no Just I'm listen, working. No, are you working? Okay, no, I'm working. In, are you working in a in a, uh, a laboratory, um, <clears throat> industrial laboratory type of thing? 
In other words, you're not yes, looking I'm at the Yes, I'm working in the material testing laboratory. And then okay. in the material testing laboratory, there is a, a standard from SAN 17025, which is a competency standard for a laboratory. And then the competency standard of a laboratory states that for each and every test, we need to use the latest standard for the specific test. And then now you find out that people are not using the latest standard. They oh. are using maybe TME, yes, instead of SANS, which is the latest. But the competency standard, which we are accredited by, by, by complying with, is, is stating that we need to use the latest. So I'm asking, is that a mistake or is it an unethical behavior? Okay. All right. It depends on, all right, let's say, uh, look at this uh, this way there. You got your standard. Did the standard come out just now or did it come long ago? If it came out long ago, that's uh, it's actually unethical. Okay. Over there. Because the persons aren't keeping themselves up to date. And if it can cause the uh, problems with uh, the health and safety of the public, then it falls under an ethical. But if it is a standard that was just put out now and the people do not know about the latest standard, you know, if it was taken about uh, two, three days or even a week ago, you've got a bit of leniency to say that is a mistake. Okay. I think the other... If it is, blat if it is blatant where they blatantly ignore the new standards on purpose, that is unethical. That's what it comes into. But if you see if the people are not doing a hearing to standards that was maybe two, three months ago, even a month ago, that is blatant, then that is unethical. But if it is a day or a week ago and they don't know, that is a mistake. If then you have to correct it. Uh, so one day, if, the, if a contractor comes to you and says, <clears throat> according to the contract document, I want the testing to be done according to this standard, and it's at, and you know that it's the standard is outdated, you need to to notify the contractor uh, <clears throat> in such a way that your uh, and copy your 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 your, um, your boss that uh, that is not the latest standard that you should be working to. But if the contractor requires you to work to that standard, obviously that is what he wants. But he, he needs to be notified by you that uh, that is an outdated standard and that um, he, uh, your laboratory is working to the latest standards. And then the contractor must say what he, is, uh, what he wants. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, if he if he wants to, to use outdated standards for some specific reason, there could be re a good reasoning for that. Then, uh, <clears throat> then you need to, to do what, what he says, but you need to notify him in the beginning first that, that, this, that it's out, out, uh, outdated and that your, uh, your boss is happy that you work according to, to what the what the contractor requires and not according to the latest standards uh, then it's not your responsibility but it is uh, the contractor or the, uh, the consulting engineers responsibility as well as your superiors responsibility okay Johan. thank you thank you for the replies any any more questions Any questions on, on registration? You're welcome to ask questions regarding uh, extra registration if, you, uh, if you're busy filling in your forms or, or you had an uh, uh, un, unwelcome letter from EXA <laughs> that you don't understand properly. Can I just come in here? Yeah, There's one hand, Chris. Go to yeah, yeah, before we go, this, we discussed the code of conduct that is under outcome eight of your document, you know, for your registration. So please take note of all this that is to help. Ready? Okay, uh, SBP, who's that? 
Uh, good day, colleagues. Uh, I'm yeah. Barbara from, and I'm in the process of registering. So I just want to check if ever there is a need for one to, to go through maybe the designs uh, in relation to maybe an experience because, okay, I'm working for the government and I haven't, I don't have much experience uh, in the consulting industries, despite that, okay, uh, we do reviews, designs and so forth. So is it, uh, 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 is it mandatory for one to do the designing, maybe just to have a, 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 a training on designs prior to registering with EXA. Thank you. Okay, I'll come in here quickly. Barbara, I just wanna know from you, are you in a managerial position? Uh, nope, I'm just a technician. But your technician but you look at the designs of consultants and other uh, persons am i correct that's correct okay so what you do is that i i'm going to ask you some questions and then that will give me an idea to explain to you how to go about it. you look at the designs and if you see there's something wrong in the design you actually check the designs with your designs and your conception idea am i right <clears throat> That's correct. In engineering design. So you are actually doing design already, but you look at one or two or selves, uh, even up to three options that you're looking at their design, if you see there's something wrong. And then when you do your calculations, then you go back to the consultant and say, but isn't it better to do it this way? Am I right? That's correct. So why do you want to go and work for consultants? That falls no, under just... outcome one, two, and three. You understand what I'm saying now? Because although yeah. you're in a position of authority, now if you look at your position of authority, you can't go and tell a consultant, no, but the design is not correct. Am I right? You have to give a reason why That's it's correct. not right. That's so correct. you are actually doing designing already. Just remember, if you look at your constitution, you're in an administrative position, you're in a position of authority. If you work for the government, you look at the design, you have to give a, a reason if you go and look under section 33 of the constitution. So basically, you are already doing designing because you can't say this design is not right. You have to tell the consultant why it's not right and what you have looked at and you said, but I would have... Uh, Think about using this design of my idea, you know, my design that you're already doing design, Barbara. Oh, oh, okay. So there's no, so need you don't to have stay to, your... you don't have to be a consultant. There are uh, people that were contractors. There's a, a person that are in managerial position that became professional technicians too, at the uh, registered at EXA, although they never worked at consultants. It's because yeah, okay. of the mindset. I don't know who gave the mindset. Everybody's got this mindset that you have to be consultants to do design. But if you're in a position of authority and you're looking at designing, you know, at the consultant's design and you see there's a problem, you change the design. You give them recommendations. You don't just work off a tick list. You look at it and you apply your mind for engineering judgment to get the design right and to get the best uh, possible solution. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Thanks for the clarity. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's a pleasure, Barbara. Okay. So the design review actually also counts as design work, but you must be able to prove that you have That's done correct. it because they got to ask you in the, in, in, in the interview. Uh, so you say you've, you've reviewed this design. What did you find? What did you... Uh, why did you question the design? How did you determine that, that the consultant's design was not up to standard or he was over-designing or he was overcharging or whatever? They're going to ask you those questions. So you, yeah, you, you must be ready to be able to, to, to explain how you did it and uh, what your reasoning was. Oh, okay. Thanks, Johan. Any other questions? Any other? Are we going home early today? 
Okay, there's just one comment I'm going to make, especially with uh, people uh, filling in the engineering report. They tend to um, outcome one, two, and three. They tend to, with the periods, they tend to use a lot or three or four periods to discuss outcome one, outcome two, and outcome three. Preferably don't do that. Just take one period or one project that you're working and try and keep it with one, two, and three. It's easier for you and it's also easier for the assessors and the interviewers to discuss that. Then remember one, two, and three is also coupled to nine and 10, outcome nine and 10. So this is what people must remember that. So when you're completing your form, don't try and say you've got three projects under outcome one, you try and discuss, you tend to generalize, you never bring out what is, what was the problem there. And also remember, when you're in the interview, say it's me, myself, and I, it's not we and the company, it's what we want to determine is what you did. Where's your responsibility? It's your own work. We're not interviewing your company, we're interviewing yourself. Uh, Dr. Sina, I see you got a question. Yeah. Chris, just, you know, because we have to keep the design record for 10 years as per regulation. Suppose we design a small yes. dam or bridge for 10 years. But other side, suppose I have designed a dam, I'll be responsible for the whole life. That is the Water Affairs Regulations Act. So yes. <laughs> So after 10 years, I should not uh, keep the record is not necessary, but other side, I am responsible for the dam design for the whole year, whole life. Yeah, I know. You know, they say, they just give us a guideline, but it's on your prerogative when you do a design of something that is very important. It's better to keep the record because basically what people don't understand, we know it too. Whatever you design, till the day you die, you have been held responsible for it. I think even after death, they can take from the insurance. Yes. But what I'm saying is, you know, even as I always tell the people, you know, if you die and you still the de design, they will come and fetch you to come and explain your design <laughs> too. You know, basically, because we've been held responsible for all our designs. Yes. But, you know, the, I've still kept all of my designs from the day I've started, <laughs> although it's more than uh, 10 years ago. So is it not more than 100 so years, Chris? Chris, regarding... Not, not yet. Not <laughs> yet your age yet, you are. <laughs> Chris, coming back to your... To your explanation about outcomes one, two, and three, uh, regarding the um, uh, the many many uh, um, uh, projects, it's what people must remember. It's not necessarily the, um, uh, the 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 most the biggest project that you worked on. To choose your project to explain you for your registration, use the the project that was the, the, the most challenging as far as engineering is concerned, that would explain your engineering ability the best. So use, use that, even if it's a small project, but if there was dif specific difficulties that you had to overcome and, and things like that, <clears throat> uh, you use that because that will explain your ability best. Razzani, you've got a question. Unmute yourself. Hi, yes, yes. Um, the first thing is with regards to sto uh, storing drawings or your design for more than 10 years, if you resign from a certain company, um, they've got, or uh, what do you call, um, I can say it is their property, your design, which means uh, in some area, in some companies, the information is protected. I cannot just leave the company and go with their, with their property, which means my design is their property. So what do, we, do I do in that case? If, if, if I'm supposed to store it, uh, the information for 10 years, if I need the information, 
do I go to those people to say, look, I need the information since I'm the one who designed. But actually it is their information because when I work for the, for the company, um, there's rules that says all the designs, they are, they, 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 they belong to the company. That's the first thing. The second thing, I just want to make a, a comment. I did go through the interviews in 2014 for my registration. So the best advice that I got there was, I should know, as a, for me to be able to know that I'm a professional, I must know my limit. I should be, as I'm a civil a, a, a professional, I should be able to, to, if I look at a project, I should be able to see that, look, this is my limit. Now it's time for me to be able to call the mechanical uh, engineer. So just that the, the best advice that I received. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll come in there with it. You're an employee of the company. So basically that the company has got the responsibility to ensure that that documents get stored. You not personally held the responsible. It's the directors and the, the people above you, your supervisor, they must ensure that they've got the standards there. It's usually the ISO 9000 standard for storing material and that's basically the process. You are not held responsible for that. They take the full responsibility. Then yeah. your com comment on... Uh, the on the you know mechanical you must know your limits you must know what you do if you're doing civil and you're working on a for instance like a, a high-rise building or in a shopping center you usually get your mechanical you get your structural you do your civil you might be a specialist in uh, the water and storage in the network you get your um services specialists which are your fire engineers that come in and they put their water pipes their pipes in you get your road specialists that do all the groundwork for you and the compactions your geotechnical you get your electrical engineers that come in and they put the electrical cable in the light and heavy duty cabling and these are the things that is where we always look for also is your ability to say that I interact with the different disciplines. That is where it comes in. You work with project engineers, you work with your uh, QSs, you work with a lot of people involved in architects too. That's what we want to see, that to prove that you as a person does not want to be a master of all trades, you know, and say, yes, I am doing electrical, mechanical. Your field is maybe just for civil, for earthworks and the infrastructure of water sewage. Then you have to have to interact with all the other different disciplines to ensure that their services and your services don't clash. And you have to interact with this, uh, the structural guys to make sure that they don't put their footings and their concrete over your services. These are the things that you do. That's what we want to see in interaction. Okay. Is that uh, help you a lot? Or it's on me. Yes, Chris. Um, I was just saying that was the best advice that I received when I did yeah. my interviews in, in 2014. It's not something that I need help with. The second part of, of uh, when I said, uh, the best advice they said I should know my 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 like I should be able yeah. to know my limit and it has helped me a lot um even uh, when I interact with my boss when he says maybe do this one let's just try and do I tell him look I'm not a specialist in this field we need to call someone now yes yeah. now you have to yeah. do that because but you registered already am I right Yes, I registered in 2014. Okay. No, no, that's good because uh, that is true. Because, you know, a good example is what I always use to explain to people of interaction. It might be before your time, but it's for me and Johan and Dr. Sina, we know exactly. And I think Anna Marie also, when they put the man on the moon, there were so many disciplines involved there to get that rocket off the earth. It wasn't just one group of people. They had to have civil engineers there doing structural. They had to have the geotechnical done. They had to have the concrete. Then they had to have the mechanical guys. They had to have the aeronautical guys. 
everybody had to work together, even had project engineers there, project managers there to ensure that everything was done on time. So these are the interactions that I say is we're not held on one side, we're on our own. And that's what we must just remember. Okay. Okay, Johan, you wanted to say something? No, not really. I'm, I'm looking here to see if there's any other hands going up. Um, no. <clears throat> there's nothing in the chat, but uh, you're welcome to ask any more questions. Raymond, you're very quiet there in the corner. There's one or two people that came in later. You're welcome to ask any questions regarding uh, the today's um, <clears throat> call. You're welcome to ask. There's nobody. You, you, you're not intruding on anybody else. So fire away if you if you're representing other people. That's fine. Uh, this this recording will be going on to the onto the website. Uh, Johan does that for us. Johan von Skalpek, and I usually. Uh, <clears throat> download it and uh, then send it to him and within a few days it goes on onto his website there. Uh, Kobo, you're welcome to ask your questions. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Johan. Uh, Mr. Johan, I was just speaking now to some of my colleagues. They just raised some collections also. Like, um, what are the requirements from somebody who, who, has, who is in hand of a national diploma qualification to register as a technologist? Question number one. Question number two, a person who is currently finishing the, 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 the BTEC, is it advice for that person to register as a candidate or the certain years required for him to register as a professional technologist? Thank you, Mr. Johan. Okay, are you going to answer your no or must I answer? Oh, you, you, you fire away. Okay, the first one is to for if somebody's got a national diploma and they want to register as a professional technologist, they have to go the alternative route. So basically under RO2 uh, SDA, under Appendix A, it says they, the national diploma, they must have eight years experience with five years at the level E. Now, if you've got a BTEC, which is your uh, benchline one, you have to have three years experience with one year at level E of responsibility. That's included in the three years. But then with the new one is an advanced diploma that you also is the same as the BTEC. And then your BNG tech is also the same. Three years with one year as uh, one year in uh, level E of responsibility. So it's basically after third year, once you've received your the qualification for your BTEC or your advanced diploma or your BA Tech Eng. Oh, so it's a, it's years in the hand of a pro, of the qualification or or in the duty as what concerning what you are registered for. Like, is it a if you're saying two years or three years, three years of having the qualification in hand? or three years of doing the duties of what you are registered for, or you're busy registering uh, for? Yeah, three years after your post-qualification for your BTEC and that. If your national diploma is eight years, at the level of a, a broadly defined engineering activity, just remember you must make sure that you've got the right uh, level of expertise. Because then... Yes, a technician is usually it's a well-defined engineering activity, but there are people that are actually working already while they got their diploma, they got it. They were started working at a broadly defined engineering activity. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you please so remember that the three years is a minimum. You don't oh, have yes. to register after three years. You can, if, if you find that you, you're not working at level three uh, at level e yet in other words after four years or so you're only starting to work at the responsible level where you are delegated full responsibility for your work <clears throat> you need that one year in that what's that so the three years is not a minimum and, and people in the in, in in the government 
uh, that are not, uh, not engineers, they don't understand this three year thing. They think you must register after three years. There's no must. It is uh, <clears throat> three years is a minimum that gives you time to 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 uh, to implement the things that you've you've been taught at university. It, it gives you time to actually implement and understand the concepts properly that you have uh, have learned. And the other question, Chris, was about the um, the, the uh, registering as a candidate can you answer that okay the candidate you can do that after you've got your qualification if you want to be registered as a candidate technician you just have to submit with your diploma and prove to the exa if you do it within one year after you've received your diploma or even after one year if you received your btec they give you the first year for free, no uh, fees that you pay for that. So as a candidate, you can do the, you can register as a candidate, but remember after a certain period of time, the candidate, that the registration fees are the same as if you have registered. You can't stay a candidate for all your life as a candidate, because a candidate means you're actually learning to be trained in that. As you answered correctly, it's three, uh, no, the three years minimum. But I find the people that I've been assessing, usually they take four to five, sometimes six years to get all the outcomes at the level that is required on their different stand, you know, for technician and for technologist. Now, regarding registration as a candidate, it is not, um, <clears throat> it's not you don't have to register as a candidate, but. Uh, uh, and, and if you register, they don't require you to, to give any um, experience requirements. They only require you to submit your, 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 your um, diploma. Now, unfortunately, many students owe the university money. And uh, so you don't get your diploma. You've got, you got a letter that, you, that you've actually qualified, uh, that you've, you've fulfilled all the re requirements for the diploma. But they don't give you your diploma or your or your degree certificate until you've paid your fees, and <clears throat> until you've got your certificate, you cannot register with EXA as a candidate. That is a, a rule that uh, that EXA has made. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with it, but um, <clears throat> uh, I, I can't tell them what to do. So um, that is the re a re requirement, and that is the. Re um, the, uh, the the rule. Thank thank you, John. Thank you, Chris. In a, in a in a scenario like my scenario, I'm just asking for myself now for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, I I've been working in a post in a duty of a technologist at my work. However, I am only completing my BTEC this year. I never register myself as a technician when I have my diploma. Um. To register myself as a technologist now, which way do I take in terms of, can I immediately, when I finish my qualification this year, register myself or because I've been working already in, in I can prove that I've been working in the post of a level of technologist. For or how long? That, um, since 2013, that's okay. probably looking at seven years, eight years like now. Okay, if you've got eight years of experience from your diploma, yes. you can apply on the alternative route. As a, as a technologist? Yes. Thank you so you much. Have to have, uh, you have to have eight years with three years mm -hmm. on level E responsibility. But if you, get to, you haven't had that and you just, uh, maybe you did one or two years experience of your um, diploma and then you went and did your BTEC, and you took, for instance, three years, you will have to wait another three years after your post qualification for your BTEC. I see. You understand where I say, right? but you, as yeah. what you explaining, it seems that you can do that. Please just write this down. It's RO2, STA. RO2, oh, it's the one for the documentary you referred us uh, the other time. Yes. Okay, that's it. Got that one. Look there at the back at uh, Appendix A. That yes. will tell you how many years that you must there. But look at the one for after 1980. 
19. That you will okay. fall under there. And then you'll see the qualifications requirements that is required there. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for that. Okay, Thank then you, do you know the thing before you run away, make yes. sure when you're looking at the document, read the te technologist section and the criteria for a, uh, for a, a broadly defined engineering activity, what it means in the definition to make All right. sure. All and right. then All also right. look under table seven. Table also seven. The same doc in that document, there it explains yeah. everything of outcome one to 11. What is All expected right. for there? Then you can also look at R08 PT. Yes. R08 PT. That is what we we use that as a criteria also. So that is for us as assessors to use. So and interviewers. There you can also pick up a lot of information. Then right. the last document you must look at, and it's right at the bottom there, under the uh, under technologist application is the guideline to uh, professional uh, to, for registration as a technologist. That guideline gives you a lot of information there too that explains it might be a little bit old compared to the new documents that have come out, but there's yes. information that you can pick up that you require. Okay, please, thank you, Chris. A big thing that people are making a mistake on, and that's where they have to pull in the requirements for legal and statutory. They tend to think, although they only talk about OHS, health and safety, they forget about the other uh, legal statutory and regulatory requirements that we require that we pick up while we're working on site, even in our offices too. And even in a design office, there's certain statutory requirements that is required. When you're designing, you have to take into consideration those statutory requirements too. Okay. Yes, thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you. Okay, it's a pleasure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No more questions? No more hands, no more notes. Let me see in the chat if there's anything there. <clears throat> oh, there's only Corbo's note. If there's no more questions, we'll, uh, we'll have another talk in two weeks' time. Meanwhile, if you want to get more information on IPET, go to IPET, I-P-E-T, Institute of Professional Engineering Technologists, uh, .org, O-R-G, .za. That's the website, and you can get more information there. And if you want to join, you can join there. Um, thanks. Uh, as I said, in two weeks' time, we'll, we'll still say what, we, what we'll be talking about. But uh, <clears throat> thank you for joining us today and giving us your time and uh, contributing. And, 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 and have a nice long weekend. <clears throat>